So uh, I'm going to speak uh, here about uh, where we think we're going here to improve some of the outcomes of sexual function recovery. Uh, a variety of, of uh, interactions that I have are listed there. By way of objectives, I'm going to present the rationale for invoking therapeutic strategies for enhancing erectile function recovery after radical prostatectomy, assess possible therapeutic strategies, and consider some future possibilities in this space as well. Now, <clears throat> in terms of the topic area, we know that surgery uh, for prostate cancer, clinically localized disease, does achieve uh, long-term rates of cancer control. Uh, ED uh, remains a significant complication uh, with the uh, advance of cavernous nerve sparing techniques. We have seen a reduction in the uh, likelihood of developing complete uh, and permanent erectile dysfunction. Uh, some of this owes to advances in understanding the anatomy and per performing nerve sparing techniques. Uh, the, the fact that we don't have a, a complete resolution of the problem is informative, and I think that tells us we're not there yet, even when we think we're doing a very, the very best surgery. And there may be various reasons for that, which I'll speak to uh, here. But uh, I think we all can agree that the rates can vary, uh, but there have been some improvements in recent decades as we carry out the surgery. And I do believe that as we have advanced with managing um, uh, men with prostate cancer surgeries, uh, we've made such achievements in other areas that this may be the last frontier beyond urinary incontinence, recovery aspects, and so forth, that this may be the, the last great frontier that we still need to achieve while carrying out radical prostatectomy surgeries. Now, there are basic mechanisms for this. Uh, we all uh, have, can sort of list all these. You know, I, I kind of group these in the uh, uh, surgical trauma that the patient may think that we have a role in in understanding the nerves of blood vessels that account for sexual function, erections in particular, uh, th that there may be factors that are, that are patient-related. We recognize these. Uh, the, the psychosocial factors of patients and their health comorbidities. And there have been a whole host of algorithms and various kinds of tools that have been put out there. I'm not going to bore you with any of that. In this short talk, uh, we recognize all of these are variables that, that are uh, possibly accountable for this. Now, I spoke about nerve sparing technique. Uh, that certainly has been pioneered uh, by Dr. Walsh and others. Why don't we see better recovery rates? Well, there's explanations, and I think there's a neuropathy uh, that we understand can occur even while we carry out nerve preservation, the nerves that innervate the penis and, and produce erection responses. I'll list some of these here, uh, and uh, at the same time, I think we have to understand that there's a great variability in these nerves and how we go about understanding uh, how we protect these nerves, and I think that's pretty much the strategies that I'm talking about that we need to carry on uh, to, to improve outcomes here. I think we've gone about here and in some of the basic science world here to try to better understand some of the basic biology that occurs, the nerve biology and, and the nerve uh, uh, injury effects here uh, that occur with uh, the stretching of nerves or, or even some sort of additional mechanisms of nerve trauma as you saw in the prior uh, slide. Uh, and I think as we understand nerve degeneration, regeneration, nerve development and so forth, we'll be able to take advantage of, of what we think are uh, the basic uh, mechanisms behind the nerve injury. In the basic science world, there's been work done uh, to try and go a little bit more molecular with this. So uh, this is just a brief uh, slide here that reports on work that we did with a team up in Albert Einstein where we went about a genome microarray of the major pelvic ganglion uh, which represents or, or resembles the pelvic plexus in the, in the human being with a cavernous nerve injury. So we went about a cavernous nerve injury model, uh, took out the MPG, the, the, the cavernous nerve, uh, looked for various nerve and gene, uh, gene changes with this nerve injury, and I just list some of the findings there. Uh, and some of these are associated with nerve protective effects, various ones with nerve development, regeneration, and even synaptic transmission. So I think we're going to really target these and think about how we might be able to carry out better ways of strategizing to use these kinds of uh, targets uh, to improve upon uh, functional recovery. In my mind, I think there are some basic uh, precepts here, concepts, if you will, for preserving sexual function. Obviously, minimizing the, the extent of nerve and vascular injury at the time of surgery, although I think it's, it's very much simplified for us just to say we know where the neurovascular bundles are and we just dissect them away from the prostate. Uh, I, th I think we need to go even a step farther. And the reason I kind of emphasize this, and I think there's too much simplification out there uh, about just this concept that we think we know where the nerves are, and I think we still do have progress to make to, pr to produce better outcomes. Uh, treating ED uh, is one way of, uh, of addressing the problem of, of erectile dysfunction. Uh, this, is, this is more a matter of just uh, uh, bringing forward our conventional th 
therapies from pills all the way up to, to penile prosthetic surgeries for that man who may have erectile dysfunction and wants to address that problem. And then I think there's ideas here uh, behind uh, promoting erectile function recovery. I list a few of these on the slide, and I think what's exciting here is to think about, again, uh, not just the rehabilitation, which is, in, uh, by definition, uh, that I'll use here as recovering function that's unassisted by medical aids, although re rehabilitation broadly in the field may refer to any uh, mechanism or approach that allows a man to be functional in the setting of post-prostatectomy ED. Uh, to, to be a little bit more refined about rehab to recover a natural level of function is another way of interpreting that word. But protection and reconstitution are some of the strategies that I'll briefly speak about in this talk. Now, there's a, a paper I put together with uh, Nate Freed a few years ago, Nature Reviews Urology, where we thought that uh, going a, even a step further here than some of the great work that some of our colleagues have done mapping out nerves around the prostate with anatomical studies, how can we actually use this at the time of surgery? And in this slide, just you can see the various technologies that have been put forward to help us strategize about identifying, localizing these nerves. Some of these have to do with nerve stimulation strategies, like electrical nerve stimulation and optical nerve stimulation. Some of these are just spectroscopy and imaging techniques. And you can see that they have their strengths and limitations. Limitations, perhaps, are that they're not consistent, they're not reliable, uh, that uh, they don't have the, the imaging resolution that we can apply in, in the setting of a surgery, and there may be some affordability issues that relate to all of these. So uh, the, the, the bottom line message is that I think that these are exciting technologies. Uh, we have to com combine, I think, both the anatomy and the functional relevance of some of these nerves, and I think that's the next uh, level of how we actually need to map out these nerves and understand what nerves we need to protect, uh, but we still need to further develop techniques that allow us to get there. This is an example of the optical coherence, to, uh, coherence tomography, finding some cavernous nerves uh, away from the prostate. Here's MRI uh, with identification of neurovascular bundle, but again, how do we use these and what's the resolution and affordability, of course, is considerations. Now. I do think there's some strategies uh, that uh, we uh, can apply for neuroprotection, and some of these actually may relate to some uh, therapeutic possibilities that we may already have. Uh, and these can, you can just see the broad categories that I put together for a, 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 a um, paper I wrote a few years back. Uh, it's interesting to think about the variety of different techniques that we might be able to exploit with therapies that we currently have available. Uh, I'm going to speak a brief bit about immunophenyl ligands, which is a strategy that we actually tried to work on a few, uh, about 10 years ago, and it didn't really succeed. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about erythropoietin uh, with a trial that we've just completed uh, based on some great scientific work. But I think all of this is thinking ahead here about, again, we're going to surgery. We know that we're going to inflict nerve injury. What can we bring that we know can be potentially neuroprotective uh, preceding the event in which the injury occurs? Now, similarly, we can think about nerve regeneration, and there are a whole host of various uh, strategies that are based on categories from various uh, neurotrophic factors, various axonal growth inhibiting neutralizers. I think this is an exciting area. You know, how do we all develop uh, developmentally with, with our nerves? There have to be factors that control the outgrowth of the nerves, and if we can figure out how to, to control these neutralizing agents, we may be able to spur uh, nerve function recovery. Uh, categories also include tissue engineering uh, and um, other ideas for, for nerve stimulation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing lately in my laboratory, we, which we think may uh, be strategic in this regard. In terms of all of this understanding of what we have in our field and a lot of basic science work that occurs in the sexual medic medicine circles, I won't bore you with all the basic science stuff, but the clinical work basically boils down to this, at least as I review the literature. These are the, the extent of work that we have. Now, we were very excited several years ago to develop uh, the, the compounds that resemble FK506. Uh, that were uh, uh, non-immunosuppressive. Uh, we actually brought that to the clinical trial and we did not see benefit by it, uh, even though we had some great success at the basic science level in rat models of nerve injury, uh, but that did not succeed. Uh, that did get a lot of excitement uh, 10 years ago, but we did not actually prove that this would work. There have been excitement surrounding corticosteroids, and can we actually uh, control the neuro nerve inflammatory effects? And actually, that's been studied in a few trials, and that's not found to be successful either. There have been some ideas surrounding stem cells, okay, and so I can tell you there is some active work in the field in that arena. Uh, clinical trials are in progress, and we still have to see really how successful that will be. That is the extent of the clinical trial work that I'm aware of surrounding this topic of cavernous nerve regeneration. 
We've done some work looking at erythropoietin. Now, we had some great ideas about this about 15 years ago where we actually were able to find out that erythropoietin is more than a hem hematopoietic agent. It's actually a nerve growth factor. And we actually studied it in nerve tissue, found that it actually can promote nerve regeneration uh, in in vitro studies and then, and then small rat studies of cavernous nerve injury. We actually brought it to human levels and did an off-label trial and saw benefit. Basically, we think this works through EPO receptors and nerve terminals that exist in endothelium as well as in nerve, uh, the actual nerves. And it may work through some various intracellular pathways. I won't get into all of the details of this, but it may converge here at brain-derived neurotrophic factor in cell nuclei that actually may drive nerve function recovery. So we just finished a trial, okay, and this is, and we're gonna, this is gonna be presented at the AUA uh, here in May uh, that looks at uh, erythropoietin in a, a randomized control trial, not an open trial that I spoke about before. And the bottom line here is we, we, while you know, we did this in a blinded fashion with sta standard tools, uh, the erectile function uh, domain scores of the IIEF, and various other kinds of questionnaires and tools that are familiar to some of you. Uh, we did not see that there was any difference between the placebo-treated and erythropoietin-treated patients at, the low, at 12 months. Now, we think there may be some explanations for this. In the earlier studies, we actually used a much more potent dosing, 40,000 international units, uh, the day before, day of, day after. There may be a, a strategy of using these therapies for an extended period of time, uh, and also even following patients up for some time longer may, may still be revealing. So, uh, unfortunately, we have great ideas in the basic science world. I can tell you, bringing the sexual medicine message to you, we've got great ideas. We still have a ways to go with great ideas that have not translated really to clinical success. The, you get, many of you are familiar with CAVRMAP and some of the nerve uh, uh, stimulator techniques that have come and gone over recent years. Uh, this is uh, one that uh, we did, um, uh, gosh, about 10 years ago, where we actually uh, uh, had developed and, show and showed that you could do an implantable electrode array and put this in the pelvis, and here's a patient in which I'm doing a radical prostatectomy, uh, put the nerve stimulators in the pelvis, and we can actually elicit uh, penile circumference increases. And so we think that this is a, an idea here to move forward where, whereby we can put into the pelvis implantable neurostimulators Okay, and this is just a proof of purpose study, and then go further with that uh, with the next level of investigation. Uh, a group that I'm working with that's uh, in um, uh, um, uh, Switzerland uh, are looking at uh, developing electrode array systems that are even bigger and more expansive in the pelvis. Uh, and they're showing here that they can even produce better responses a greater proportion of patients. And the idea here is once you remove the prostate, you kind of put these arrays in the pelvis where you think the nerves are, and then you can actually stimulate, again, a proof of purpose study, erection responses with the idea that this is going to be the foundation to actually do studies where we can put in implantable st uh, stimulators uh, and stimulate these nerves uh, for two purposes, either to produce erections on demand or to help with nerve regeneration. So this is the idea, and in fact, we've already started to do that in rat studies now. So, in, so what this is here is, is um, uh, a rat model in which we've done nerve injuries. We actually put stimulators in the rats, uh, sew them up. We did a kind of a protocol of nerve stimulation daily for seven days in these rats and then brought them back seven days later and did erection studies. And what you see here at the bottom of the slide are various rat erection tracings. I won't bore you with all the details of that, but the bottom line is in those animals in which we actually did daily stimulations, they mimic, mimic the erection responses of sham treated animals, suggesting that just doing this nerve stimulation repeatedly helped their nerve function recovery versus those that did not receive the, the stir nerve stimulation protocol. So the idea here of actually doing implantable nerve stimulators that can help with nerve regen regeneration, we're showing in rat models, and we think that may next uh, translate to human studies that we can do, uh, this same, same sort of investigation. So that's, that's coming in the near future. So I'm gonna try and close here. Uh, this is meant to be just a, a short talk and tell you where we are with cavernous nerve function recovery, uh, what uh, strategies have been used. I think that there are some ideas in the future uh, to further develop this. I think uh, it, there are some studies with testosterone, believe it or not, uh, to actually help with nerve function recovery. Um, uh, so appropriately selected patients in this setting uh, would be ones we'd consider that for, but uh, there has been some evidence that, that testosterone can help with nerve function recovery and development. Uh, erythropoietin I spoke of, various kinds of nerve guides and biolo biological scaffolding 
scaffolds are, are being studied. I spoke to you about neurostimulators. And these areas here toward the bottom are always of interest. They're all buzzwords here. They're all very exciting. Uh, I think at this stage, we really do not have great evidence that they work in this clinical setting. Or much in, in, in fact, the evidence is still somewhat poor in any clinical setting. But I think it's still interesting and exciting that we may bring these sorts of uh, possibilities uh, for us to the future. So by way of conclusion, uh, I think that uh, understanding uh, the uh, cavernous nerve function and bringing forward various strategies that reconstitute this function uh, will be the way to bring forward better functional recovery uh, after radical prostatectomy. And I think despite current surgical modifications in the field, uh, we still have uh, ways to go to develop these therapies to improve these outcomes. And this will occur, I think, with um, good basic scientific work along, along with clinical trial uh, studies that uh, will bring about this progress. So I appreciate your attention, and I will close there. Thank you.